Good morning. Today is Thursday, July 27, 2017. Once again, this is Mark DePew, and I'm sitting across from Connie Edwards. Good morning, Connie. Good morning, Mark. We had quite a conversation yesterday about uh, your experiences growing up in Birmingham, your involvement with the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, those were memorable years, and maybe not necessarily always in a positive mm -hmm. sense for you, but you were right in the middle of all of that, and it was amazing to hear those stories. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask a question here you and I had just talked briefly about last night, and it occurred to me, growing up where you grew up, I bet you had all kinds of chores to do, you and all the other kids. What were your chores? Well, we had to wash the dishes. We had to, whenever it was gardening season, we had to hold the garden, like, you know, with that hole to get rid of the weeds, uh, pick vegetables when it was necessary. My daddy was um, a hunter, so whenever he'd come in with the rabbit all shot up, we'd have to skin it. And... Uh, well, it's your first lesson in anatomy then. Yep. <laughs> and he he, he could put some, book, oh, what they call them, shots through a rabbit. So the buckshot, yeah. We didn't really want to eat it, but we sometimes had to. Uh, he would go fishing, and we'd have to do the fish. And uh, most of the time, he would give them away. But he didn't expect to give the fish to whoever he was going to give it to without it having been cleaned. So once upon a time, I just gave the fish to somebody and it wasn't cleaned, and that was one of my daddy disciplines. <laughs> so he didn't like that. Who was, who was taking care of the chickens and the hogs and the milk cow? Well, for the hogs, we just pretty much gave them what we call slop. <laughs> it would be the food from the table. We'd feed them. Um, that was kind of a fun thing, so we wouldn't we'd kind of race over doing that one. But because we had a fireplace and a wood stove, we'd have to, my brothers would chop the wood and we'd have to load it up and take it into the house and set it beside the fireplace and the cook stove. Did and you, uh, Did you know how to milk the cow? No, no. I tried that once when I was about five at my grandmother's, and the cow slapped me in the face with the tail, and so grandmother didn't want that to happen anymore. <laughs> Hogs are, well, shall we say, odiferous. I wonder if the neighbors liked you guys having hogs on the property. Most of the time when we had the hogs, we didn't have neighbors. Ah. So the neighbors came a while after and then we got rid of them as people built houses around us. Okay. Well, let's move on to your college years. And the, what I wanted, because you and I talked quite a bit about your college experiences, but I wanted to go back to what was going on in the Civil Rights Movement at the time and ask if you remember some of those. And especially April 1963, and we kind of referred to this a little bit last time, mm -hmm. but that was when Martin Luther King came to Birmingham again in a very deliberate attempt to integrate a lot of the different uh, institutions in the city. And that was when, I think in May, when he was arrested and mm -hmm. spent some time in jail and he wrote that very famous letter from the Birmingham jail. Well, that was one year of the civil rights that I missed. Uh, I was a student at, no, I didn't. I didn't miss it. I was in college at the time. It was in 1964 that I missed a year because Tuskegee sent its nursing students to Baltimore for the year. Um, I was in college, and um, we were not allowed to leave college to go and join up with the Civil Rights Movement. Were then. you watching those events pretty closely? Watching the v was not exactly something that happened there. No, we didn't watch it. We, th we would listen to it, but TV was not exactly the best thing going on, and we were, Tuskegee was sort of in the rural area and didn't pick up very well. Newspapers came a few days later, so. Were you, let me put it this way, then. Were you following the events pretty closely? Yeah, we followed them, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. How about uh, August 28th? But that was, it was rather anxious because we wanted to leave, but that was one of the threats. Administration said, no way. They wouldn't allow us to go. Well, they were still being very protective of you. <laughs> August of 1963, that's when King had that huge rally in Washington, D.C., and he gave that powerful, I have a dream speech. Mm-hmm. Did you get a chance to listen to that? No, I didn't. I listened to it, but I wasn't able to join the march because for nursing students, we did year-round school. How important for you was, how meaningful was that speech to you? It was very meaningful. Uh, and I have a dream. <laughs> and I think pretty much I had felt the dream along with them. And I think because he spent a lot of time in Birmingham and whenever we had a chance, we would go and listen to him. So we kind of had a feeling of what he was going to say or what what he wanted, his vision. We had caught that. So it was very important to hear it. I think we were also intrigued with how well he said it, you know, because it's he was such an orator. So It had such mm-hmm. a powerful impact on the entire country at the time, yeah. too. I was more amazed at the numbers of people who actually ended up there. Yeah encouraging to hear all of that oh yes yes well on the flip side september 15th 1963 one of the most infamous events of the civil rights movement and that's when the 16th street baptist church where you had been many times mm-hmm. was bombed and the four young girls this was a sunday of all days and four young girls mm-hmm. were killed in that remember hearing about that news i heard about it and it was very stressful because after they were identified we knew I knew all of them especially the McNair girl and she was a very close friend of my brother's and uh, Chris McNair her father had he was one of the two photographers in Birmingham so he'd taken a lot of our pictures uh, before uh, that happened so we were quite familiar with it we also heard about two other kids who got killed, that they were not mentioned very often, but there were two boys that were also killed, not at the church, but on their bicycles away from the church. Did you have a chance to go to the funeral? No, no. Again, the administration wouldn't let you go? I guess we may have been tied up into activities, um, so no, we didn't go. So you have this incredibly uplifting moment where Martin Luther King's in Washington, D.C. A month later, you have this incident. What was your reaction? Were you angry? We were angry, and I think, and I can't totally remember, but I think we had an impromptu assembly in the gym at Tuskegee, and we kind of prayed for what was going on. And we got the administration a little sweet talk <laughs> that we will remain on campus and we will remain nonviolent. So, Still committed to Martin Luther King's vision then? Yeah. November 22nd, 1963, and this is something I ask almost everybody we interview. That was the day that Kennedy was assassinated. That was a disaster. Uh, not a disaster, but it was... You could almost hear a pen drop on the campus when that happened. It was announced through our cafeteria uh, sound booth, and it was just tears all over the place after that. Even more powerful reaction than hearing about the bombing at the 16th Street Church? I think so, yes. that was the president of the United States as well, because, and he was backing um, what Martin Luther King was doing. And so we felt, felt like Martin Luther King uh, is doing what he's doing. Uh, our support system is, may die with it. So that was hard, hard. 
It didn't die, though. And mm -hmm. one of the events I know you recall is March of 65, at the Selma March at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Mm -hmm. I know you weren't involved with that, but what do you remember about that event? We heard about it. <laughs> Again, we figured Selma is pretty close to Tuskegee, but we couldn't go to that either. And uh, we just cheered for the people, and we just sat around and sang, we shall overcome. But we also went to class. I think my classmates, nursing students, we all wore black dress and we sat in class and we would not talk back to the teacher when she asked questions. So they felt, but that didn't impress them. She just finished class and that was it. Why that in form of a protest? It was silent. It was kind of mourning. Um, we knew what we wanted to do, but we could not do it and that had not been unusual for our class. We had been not allowed to do a lot of things and we were having, with many of us from Birmingham, um, had been through a lot of what they were going through. And so we just did what we could do best and that was to pray for them that nobody would get harmed as they crossed over the bridge. and. The local news was not really picking it up in a way that we could get it as it was occurring. So we just had to wait for the news to come out. Was your heart with all those marchers on that bridge? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. That's where you wanted to be? <laughs> we wanted to be there, yeah. yeah. And we had not been able to do what we had done in Birmingham, like support their movements you know, by collecting money or putting gas in the buses or anything like that, so. In retrospect, uh, do you think the administration at Tuskegee was right to prevent you from being involved in these things? I think so, because we had students that came from all over the world pretty much. And uh, I think at that point, we knew that that would be too much responsibility on them to allow us off the campus but we stayed on the campus and we prepared because we thought that they may eventually end up where we were because they were going from Selma to Montgomery. That wasn't too far away from us, so we just kind of thought that it would eventually end up on the campus anyway. But they were pretty protective of their campus. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm wondering if the administrators of the university were thinking, now we have the next generation of leaders right here on campus and we're gonna make sure that they are ready to go out there into the world. That'd be a nice thing that they would, <laughs> if they had thought that. <laughs> but I think they felt more obligated to our parents. <laughs> not to a, They knew the dangers that were out there. And uh, as I see 20, 20, 19 to 20 year, year old children now, I think our thought process wasn't that great, and so somebody was thinking for us. Okay. Of course, after the tragedy of the Kennedy assassination and everything that had happened before, um, finally there was some legislation, important legislation moving through Congress. You've got the Civil Rights Act that passed in 1964, the Voting Rights Act that passed in 1965. Um, what was your feeling when those pieces of legislation got passed? I thought for the first time my parents would be able to vote. <laughs> I was, I don't think they were allowing 18 year olds to vote at that point, so we didn't. In fact, I think my first voting, I was about 22, 23. So um, it was important because I think I got a letter. Of course, you, you're doing letters, we're not doing cell phones. So my parents was anxious to get there and register to vote. Their first vote would have been possibly 66 then, 1966? Probably. Mm -hmm. And then 68 with the presidential election. This is a time also, 
I don't need to tell you that the anti-war movement was really starting to gear up by the time you left college. How much did you even know about the Vietnam War at that time? <laughs> Didn't know a whole lot. Um, again, I tell you, it was like, you know, the transistor radio was not bringing the news in real clear. The newspaper came in late. So we didn't really get the feeling that they were recruiting nurses because they had a war going on. They just made it sound like, you know, the military needed these nurses. And so I chalk it up to us not really keeping up very much. We, academia was our thing. And so we had to, knew we had to get those grade points, keep them so that we could graduate and not have to get back. So a lot of the news, I think, was probably because we were just overwhelmed with school and just didn't do it. Nobody talked about it at college in terms of, you know, war and what it meant to us. Uh, even the ROTC, the students who were mandatorily in ROTC, they were just looking at getting out being officers when they got out and just strutting their stuff. And that's where we were. We were looking forward to going into the military, but not necessarily the war. Had you given any thought about whether or not the United States was right to be in the war in the first place? We didn't know what it was, really. <laughs> they were calling it a conflict. In fact, when I went, it probably still was not called a war. And uh, it was strange when I actually got to the war. This is not what we thought a war was. We kind of had a vision of somebody over on that side and they are got a big trench in between them. They're just shooting it out. But we didn't expect that it was one of those things that people right next to you might have been the enemy. And so we learned about guerrilla warfare. And... Uh, that was new, I think, a whole new concept even to the military. But you only kind of figured those pieces out once you got to the theater in the first place, when you first got there? I had what they call overseas preparation for, let's see, overseas training, okay. And so they kind of told you about those kinds of things, but that was at the end of my first year in the, in the military. When, after I got orders, that I had a two-week um, training before I went over. Just one more question about your time in Tuskegee, and that's the culmination of it all and your graduation. I got to believe your parents were just, they were very proud of their young daughter at graduation. They were extremely proud, and my class was kind of mixed up. We had decided that some things had occurred when we were in Baltimore that we were not going to graduate. And then my mother started telling me about the new hat she'd gotten and all that. And my sisters were telling me about now they can get back their money that was being spent on me to go to college. And we just decided that we, all the way up until about two weeks before graduation, our nursing class said we were not going to march. And we started thinking about those proud parents <laughs> who were doing all kinds of things to drive that three hours to get there. And so we decided we better get on over there. Otherwise, we might be getting a beating on graduation day by our parents if we didn't. So, Connie, I think I'm missing something here. What happened in Baltimore? In Baltimore, that was... The first time that Tuskegee has sent nursing students to Baltimore, the classes before us had been to New York. We could not do serious clinical nursing in Alabama, some of it because the hospital there was not fully, didn't have that much activity, or they had activity, but it wasn't at the level they wanted us to have it. And uh, so, and the white, we couldn't go into the white hospitals as students, so we were sent off where black students could do clinicals. And so we got put in apartments. Uh, 
the administration assigned us there. Uh, for the first time, some of us were seeing things that we had never seen before. Most of us had never lived in an apartment because we lived in houses with land around them. And there we were on Pennsylvania, near Pennsylvania Avenue in Baltimore. And all of these, there were homosexuals <laughs> that were trying, there was 42 girls in this particular area. So they were there trying to recruit or whatever. And we were trying to tell the administration what was going on and they didn't really come to our rescue. Uh, we had one of our classmates who got measles and she was dismissed from the class because she had measles. And uh, we had trouble with the landlord. Uh, he didn't do things that we wanted him to do. And it was, let's see, I turned 21 when I was there. So most of us were somewhere between 20 and 21. We didn't know anything about dealing with landlords and that kind of thing. And so that was really a, a hassle. And then the, I think I had been one that was punished. I had a, an assignment that, well, a patient fell after she delivered a baby. And I had taken her to a room and I did everything I was supposed to do to secure her in her bed. But then I was accused of, um, the, the patient fell, so it was my fault. Although it was hours later and she had been turned over to the staff that was there. And my punishment was for a month. I had to go to the University of Maryland and research every legal brief that had anything to do <laughs> with a nurse in malpractice. And so I had no social time after that because I spent most of my time there. And uh, the other thing was we had to, even though we were sent from Alabama to have a more integrated experience, we didn't. We were from a four-year program and the other people, the white people there were hospital-based nursing and we'd have these little fights about um, those baccalaureate people were gonna we could think but we couldn't work and <laughs> they were technical but they couldn't think so we'd have these little fights and we would get into trouble but we never started them so when we got to Tuskegee we were upset because they did the instructors didn't come to our rescue they sent their own instructors there. The people who were with us were paid by Tuskegee, but they didn't really support us when we gave them complaints. And we had to, we couldn't use the library there either, so we still had to have our own journals and we had to pay for them. So we were just protesting that they did not research that situation very well before we came and what we were telling them they would take the other people's side rather than take the student's side, so. These fights you were talking about, yeah. is that verbal arguments or? They were verbal, verbal, yeah. And how much was race involved with that tension? I think most of it was race. Uh, some of it was the, the distinction between a nurse who goes to a university versus a nurse who goes to a hospital, so that was kind of child play for us. But some of it got to be race um, when we have the little arguments about what was going on. And they would say things like, even though we were at a university and we thought we were gonna be better than them when we came out, we, because we were black, we would never work over them. Though our degree was preparing us to be uh, superior to them. Did you hear the mm -hmm. N-word used in any during that time frame? Oh, well, that was pretty plentiful. From the, it, the white nurses? Yeah, yeah. But it was, at the time, the N-word was not as offensive as it is today because we'd heard it so much. I mean, you'd see it written in the newspaper. Even when it came to housing, niggers need not apply, <laughs> you know, so. It was not a, I mean, we just looked, 
it was an offense, but it was not as offensive as it is today. Okay, so you've got this up moment mm. then graduating from Tuskegee, and rightfully so. You still have to take some kind of nursing exam to actually practice, right? Yes. Tell me about that. That's the trauma of all traumas for a nurse. <laughs> you have spent four years in school and you're still not a nurse until you pass that exam. So for us, it was at the time, I think for everybody, it was two or two and a half days that you'd sit and write and write and write, mostly multiple choice questions. So you can imagine how long it was, covered all subjects that we'd have. But for us, we took it somewhere in the state capital. I don't remember exactly what the building was, but it was in Montgomery. But we were not, we had to take our own lunch. And with most of us having been from out of town, there was only two of our classmates that lived in Montgomery. So we went, some of us stayed at her house and we packed a lunch to take, but we whatever we took, we'd have to take it for the day because there was no restaurant where we could go and nowhere to go for a break or anything like that. So, but we had been prepared. That's the way it was going to be. And so we just, we just wanted to pass that exam. How and many actually took the exam, do you recall? How many? I don't recall. There were other people other than Tuskegee students. How many from Tuskegee? I think my class graduated with 42. 42 nurse candidates? Yeah. You know basically how many passed the exam then? I think on the first round there were only nine of us who passed. And we found out that the nine of us who passed, well it was like they came out in segments. Um, we, that was one of our fears too, that we would arbitrarily have our tests fixed so that we would not pass. But when I got my results back, it had a big stamp on it that said expedite. And when I checked out with the others, we found out that the ones of us who were army bound all had the expedite on it. So they had expedited ours. And our results came back in one month, whereas the other students still had to wait the traditional three months to get their results. And after that, I think probably most of them passed, but there were a couple who had to, I think we could take it three times and, and then you're out but uh, I think all of them eventually passed. But it was slow, and that was pressure on the school as well because if they didn't have a good um, pass rate, then the school would be on probation. But the Army, one of us, we just, we had what we needed and we took off. <laughs> you passed then? I passed. And do not pass goals, go straight to the Army, huh? Yep, and I had one week's notice <laughs> to get there. May well, have been even less than a week, but. Where in this process were you actually commissioned? I was commissioned six months before I graduated from college. Second lieutenant. Second. But before that, we went in as private first class. So in June of 1964, we went in as private first class and then in December of 65, we were commissioned as uh, second lieutenant. And you're commissioned in what branch? And it sounds like a silly question, but I want to make sure I understand. Army Nurse Corps. Okay. Was that part of the, were you a WAC as well? I was a WAC before, the, for the first 18 months, I was a WAC. So the Army Nurse Corps is a specific designation. Were there any male nurses? No. In fact, I don't think they started taking male nurses until that year. 
but there were no male nurses in my class in a way. Okay. Expedite it. Go where next then? I went to San Antonio, Texas. That was where you do basic. And that was, um, it's usually a six week assignment. But at that point, when we got there, we found that they'd had a new class almost every week or so. And that's when we realized they were getting us ready for Vietnam. <laughs> and strictly nurses in your basic class? No, there were anybody who was in the medical corps. Uh, well, there was the medical corps, which are doctors. There was the medical service corps, which are those administrators and social workers and all that, veterinarians. Um, so, and the nurses. We were all in the same class. So men and women together in the same class. Yes. And if I remember correctly, you really hadn't had any kind of military training up to this point, had you? Not really, except for the rules. <laughs> no, basic is where you get the training. So learning how to march? That was the uh, in June of... 1966 was my first time in a uniform and having to march. What but the think? whole time I was, the last part of my college, I was actually active duty in the Army. But I didn't realize I was active duty, but we were attached to the ROTC and to Fort McPherson, Georgia. But we, never, we only went there for physical exams and things like that. What other kind of things did you encounter when you went through the basic officer training at Fort Sam Houston? Well, most of it is wake up early. <laughs> we were taught uh, all the paperwork with the military. We were taught the marching. Uh, we were taught how to do emergency treatments in the field, like using our ballpoint pens to start a tracheotomy, how to, uh, when and how to do chest tubes, uh, suturing, and uh, just basically to triage uh, people because we were expecting that whenever we got a casualty, it would no longer be one person you're looking at, but you may be looking at 15, 20, 100 people at one time. So to quickly assess those people and separate them into categories of how you were going to treat them. But the overall goal was to conserve the fighting strength. So that was our focus. So if you got somebody who looks like he's going to die, you put him in one category, you assign other people to work with them. Then if you got the walking wounded, you take care of them real quick because they're going to help you with the dying ones and those who need surgery and that kind of thing. So having us all together there with the physicians and the veterinarians and, well, we had physical therapists and occupational therapists and nutritionists. We had the whole team of people that would work in a hospital. So we all worked together. Did I hear right that the goal was to work with the patients so that as many as possible would return back to combat? Yes. Okay. Uh, what were you being told in terms of uh, conduct of yourself? You know, you're a nurse, you're working around doctors, you're working around lots of males, and you're working around a lot of patients who are all males. What mm -hmm. were you being told in, as far as that? Well, one of the first things we were taught was to look at somebody's hands, and if you see a little sun, if he's all suntan, but you see a white spot there, that means that's not one you want to spend much time with because he is his wife is married. <laughs> and uh, we were also taught not to, we were, officers were not to fraternize with enlisted, which meant that you look around and you really, if you want a boyfriend and you don't see one of your kind, then you're just going to have to do without. Um, and you were an officer first, a lady next, and nurse last. A nurse last? Yeah. 
Did yeah. that stick in your craw a little bit? If that was well, your... yeah, yeah, it did. But we kind of heard some of that at college. They would said you're a nurse first and a person net last. And so you kind of have to scramble that out. But I think it's pretty much to tell you what your role is. So if you end the you are, you're an officer. So if there's some reason why you've got to take over. So we were taught a lot of leadership. So if you were taught to take over and leadership was more important than your own personal thing, then you got to do the leadership first. And so it, it didn't take too long for us to sort that out. And did you understand and accept that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about what you found yourself, what was expected of nurses in the Army versus what nurses would be doing in the civilian life? For me, I haven't looked at it later. I think it was to my advantage because I had no, except for my student experience, I had no civilian experience, so I didn't have anything to argue with. I was directly out of school into the military, whereas some other people who had worked as a civilian nurse would have that fight. But having come from Tuskegee, and when we looked around at what other people were doing, we had been very much trained to have leadership responsibility while we were at Tuskegee. Because even though we were not a hospital school, they were not supposed to be dependent upon students. The students had a large amount of responsibility uh, at that campus hospital. It's like so we, we were we had to actually function as a supervisor. And sometimes we worked as the evening supervisor. Although our classmates were home sleeping, nursing students were at the hospital working. And so we would really be in charge of other people that were working there. Were you able to do more medical procedures as an army nurse than a civilian might be expected to do? Oh, yes. Um, having come from Tuskegee, we had been taught how to do certain things like draw blood, but I had never drawn it. You went through the whole procedure all except sticking somebody. Um, things like catheterizations, uh, we had done that because we didn't have mannequins like the nursing schools have today. So a lot of the things you would have to do upon yourself, uh, your classmates, like put a tube down each other's nose. And that was a nasogastric tube. We knew the importance of doing it, so we did it. But being that it was a requirement that you have to do one before you pass that segment of class, when I got to basic, we knew those kinds of things. But doing suturing and starting a tracheotomy and things like that, we didn't. We learned that in basic class. But have... when I came back into civilian world, we didn't do any of that. That got to be a little bit of a downer. It was very frustrating because you, for me, I didn't know the civilians didn't do that because I'd never worked as a civilian. And then I knew how to do all of that and I could do it without somebody else telling me to do it because you were trained to do your own assessment. So when I got back to the civilian world, I w was in the reserves. And if you started, I did quite a few of the things that I wasn't supposed to do. I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to do it because it was automatic to me. And that was frustrating to be reprimanded when you know that you'd done something that was almost helping to save somebody's life and you get reprimanded for it. So, hmm. and then, but it, it was comforting because then we started meeting other nurses who had been to Vietnam and they were experiencing the same thing. So we became each other's support systems. So in that case, it sounds like it wasn't because you were black, it was because of your different experiences in the army that you were having. And oh yeah. yeah. Did, were you learning anything where, during you went through the basic training about Vietnam, about the culture, about what you would expect when you got there? Yeah. We. We learned what they thought we needed to know, but when we got there, we found that, that there was more. But uh, yes, we were taught that because it was the guerrilla war, 
that you might be offered a Coke and you don't want to take it. You don't want to eat anything off the economy because they had had experience with people grinding up glass and putting it in a Coke. And so when you drink it, you're in trouble. We had also uh, learned that some of the girls would work in brothels and that we would, as a female, you don't want to have sex with anybody there because if they go out and have sex with somebody in the city, they may come back with some stuff because even though they were told that a person might have a razor blade inside of them and that would cut them up, some of them didn't. They would take antibiotics before they went over, but we were told that if you take these antibiotics before you go, you may be masking a disease that you will contract over there. So I was very cautious about that kind of thing. But uh, in terms of culture, it was more that there's certain, if you, you don't go to somebody's home unless you are under the guidance of the military because you just might be going into an enemy territory. And so it was very protective. Um, well, I would imagine hearing those mm -hmm. kinds of things, you're paying attention to that lesson. Oh, I paid attention. I paid attention. <laughs> now, this is a little different, yeah. but a question here for you. But this was always being presented as a war against the spread of communism. At that point in your life, what were your personal views about communism? Hmm. From what I know, there were lots of civil rights leaders who were accused of being communists because there was such hmm. a, a stigma about it. They were accused of being communism, but I had also studied um, world history in high school, and I didn't see anything that was similar with what Martin Luther King was doing with what I had read about what communism is, and it was that they control almost everything that the people did. Their work, you worked for the government instead of for yourself and that, those kinds of things. And I just thought that it was just a, a way that the people would say Martin Luther King was a communist just because that was an offensive kind of word. And they just used it just to for the effect of it mm -hmm. because it did not line up with anything that I had studied in world government so did you accept the argument then that the the united states was justified in their attempt to stop the spread of communism to being in vietnam yeah i i let's see let's get that question again I, I did you accept that the united states was justified to be fighting the war in vietnam or did you even think much about it in that term I didn't think about it in that term. I was hearing a lot of people saying we don't supposed to be here. Uh, but from a nurse perspective, I was looking at here are, are my age group fighting this. So I had been taught that no matter who is sick or injured, as a nurse, my obligation was to take care of them. And basically what we were looking at was taking care of our comrades, our our age group. I was looking at my, Mr. Hoosie over there might be, you know, one of my future husbands might be in this group. <laughs> and so we were looking at just protecting and taking care of them. So we didn't get wound up as a nurse. I didn't. Didn't get too wound up in the politics and the government with it. It was just that we've got to person here who's got to be returned back to himself as much as we could do that. One more question about your basic training experience, or your basic officer training, I should say. You are in the South still. What, did you encounter any racial prejudice while you were going through this training? Not really. I didn't. I don't think I did. There were some things that you just had to excuse. Um, when I left basic training, I actually rode across Texas with a white guy, just me and him in a Volkswagen. And so we had great conversation. 
and a fellow officer a fellow officer mm -hmm. so i think at that time we just began when i was at basic people were from all over the united states and so we just saw each other as who they were and we were you may have shared the bathroom with somebody and it, some of the interesting things girls would come up and if we were using the hot comb to straighten our hair they would ask well are you are are you cooking your hair and we would ask but well, i saw you ironing yours you were doing the <laughs> same thing so it was a lot of that they were trying to get to see for the first time, they're seeing black people. For me, that was not my first time seeing white people because I worked for them. And but it, it sounds it was like fun. those experiences, you're building some camaraderie among yourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where to then after uh, your first experience in the Army? I was then assigned to uh, William Beaumont Hospital in El Paso, Texas. And there I was assigned as a medical surgical nurse. So well, that's where Fort Bliss is. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how long were you there? It was almost a year to the date. Um, and that was their plan. I their didn't know it. The Army's? The Army's plan was that if you're a new graduate, you stay stateside and you practice in a hospital before you're sent to Vietnam. But at the time I was in, you would expect an assignment, a reassignment every year. So that was my time to get a reassignment anyway, but I didn't expect Vietnam. So you weren't looking for that? No. Why not? That wasn't what I went in there for. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to see you know, the buildup, 66, 67, early 68. Yeah, we were taking up. care of people who had been in Vietnam, who had been transferred back. And you kind of would expect that at some point you were going to go. It's just that I didn't, ex I wasn't anxious to go at that point. Did you get promoted while you were there? I got promoted six months after I got there. To first lieutenant? Yes, and that raised some racial issues because the people, when I got there, I was working under people. But when I got promoted, that meant that I was going to be the boss of some of the people who were there already. And they didn't. When I went to, I got called to the general's office. They thought I was being called in on the carpet for being in trouble. But when I came back and my butterball was gone and I had a silver bar, <laughs> they, uh, one of the persons that worked with me made some pretty nasty comments about it. Um, what did she say? He was going to volunteer to go to Vietnam because he knew what was coming next. And the discussion got to be, it was time for the head nurse to move out, and then I would become the head nurse on that floor. So he volunteered to get away from that. Uh, there was a civilian that was working there who, it kind of ruffled her feathers a little bit because I was just my coming, because in the, in the Army, the Army personnel is outranks the civilian personnel no matter how much experience the civilian has. And she had a little difficulty with having to be working with me and I was her boss. And she was had been a nurse since before I was born, she said. And so that I could understand her point of view. And I just said, I sure hope I can learn a lot from you. And she was like, you're not learning anything here. And I found that at times they would give me um, an incomplete report on the patients that I was to, as they were leaving and I was coming. And then I would have to spend a lot of extra time to really find out what I needed to know about the patients. And uh, in discussing with people what I should have expected to hear in a report about the patients to make my job easier to come on, found out that they were just 
withholding information. And then I got to learn the value of getting, making friends with the secretary and the chief, the ward master, because that's where your knowledge is going to come from. And the knowledge that you receive from someone is going to, it could determine how well you do on your job. And that was, you know, I was a little upset with her about doing that, but then I was thankful that she did it early enough so that I was aware and I could be cautious as I went through. You're learning some important lessons there that they didn't teach you yeah, at the schoolhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was this resentment because you were so young and inexperienced or because you were black? Well, I had a Spanish nurse who worked there who we became close and she thought it was more, it was both, but it was more the fact that I was younger. So I just had to let them, she was older than me as well. In fact, everybody was older than me <laughs> at the time. And I just had to say, you know, just kind of walk through and make, I'd ask questions, but they all needed to know that I was not tipping and that I knew I was well prepared for what I came there to do. So I was encouraged to set them all at ease by letting them know that I am well prepared and the racism thing that I could, that was their problem and not mine. Other than all of that, did you enjoy your experience while you were at Fort Bliss? I did. I did. Get into Mexico? Because it's right on the border. I walked over there a couple times. Yes, I did. I went to a bullfight, uh, which was very unusual. Uh, but I also had patients who had been there, and it was a lot of precautions that we had because we would sometimes get patients, military people who had been over there and gotten into trouble. So um, it was a learning experience for me all the way because you got to experience things that you'd not been told, and a lot of it with, within the context of work. Um, I did find that I worked the night shift more than I thought I should have because I think I was being punished. I, in fact, I asked for the night shift at one point and the boss did not want to give it to me. And she told me why she was not going to give it. I wanted the night shift. I asked for it because I wanted to start my master's degree. And I was told before I left Tuskegee that you're going to be a nobody without a master's degree. So I went there and I asked for that, but she refused it. But after it was too late for me to get enrolled in school, it looked like I was always getting the night shift. So she did say, you know, why would we let you go and start a master's degree at this point and you're just a brand new nurse? Well, on one of our assemblies, we found out that the real reason for that was she had just gotten her bachelor's degree and she must have been about 15, 20 years into nursing already. And here I am, less than six months out of school, one, one to start. So I could see that. And there were only, I can't say how many nurses were there at the time, but it was less than one-tenth of people who had a bachelor's degree. Oh. So I came in with what most of them did not have. And so I'm asking to be advanced over, and that didn't go over too well. So I think it was more uh, a professional mobility thing than it was racism. While you're at uh, in El Paso, were you paying any more attention to what was going on in the news? I mean, 67 oh, yeah. is when the anti-war protests really ramped up. Mm -hmm. uh, draft, you know, burning draft cards, protests on campuses, and things like that. Yes, I was paying attention then because I was having patients who were coming. They had people who had been injured, and I felt a little protective of them sometimes because they were listening to these news. And as I was making my rounds in the 
ward sometimes i would turn it down so they wouldn't hear because i was thinking here they've lost a limb and somebody is protesting what they've done but at the same time they were not just protesting the war itself and that they had been there some of those people who they were beginning to um, accuse the soldier of having caused the war and so it was difficult for the ones who already injured to be saying well it wouldn't have been a war if you hadn't done this if you hadn't been there it wouldn't have gone on was that connection making you angry Oh, yeah, because we didn't have any choice, especially when I got my orders. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the next step. <laughs> Connie, let's go to the saga of your trip to Vietnam, because it's not the typical experience. How did you find out about the, first of all, how did you find out about it? Well, I think somebody from personnel called me and said they had a twisk. And about that time... What's a twisk? A twisk is just a little letter that says this person is on orders it's not an order itself it's not the one that they can hand to me and say this is your orders keep 10 copies of it and do everything you're going to do with it no it was just somebody giving me a verbal the same way that it was when i went in they called my mother and said she's supposed to be there but we didn't have this paper so when we got there let's see i don't remember how long I had but it wasn't it wasn't a full month which you should have had a month notice before you were to go because they were giving people a month's leave before they went to Vietnam I didn't have a full month to go you had some leave though I had a little bit yeah and um, when I actually so I went home to Birmingham got prepared to go, took my little picture. And the, that was the first time my daddy says, I never thought, are you sure you, I didn't believe you wanted to do this stuff. And I thought, but daddy, when I was 19, you were the one who signed me in. But he didn't realize that it meant all that either. Uh, so he had signed for me because when I got on active duty, I had to re-sign the papers because I was then old enough to sign for myself. And when, let's see, where am I? Was it hard to leave your parents then? Was that an emotional event? It was hard then and because I think they had not processed the whole thing that if you're in the army, you're going to go to the war, you're going to go to these different places that they're going to send you. And they made it a little bit more difficult for me to go as well. Uh, and at that point in time, I had figured out that I'm entitled to fly in, so I didn't have to take a train to get where I had to go. My The twist that I did get sent me to... San Francisco and when I got to San Francisco and it was time for me to take the flight find out that I they did not have orders for me and so when I got there in San Francisco they had told me to bring fifty dollars because that's all you're gonna need and that's what I did and a few clothes they counted out and told you what all you needed to bring. So I said, okay, I took all of that, get to San Francisco. And when I saw this, I, they didn't have me on a flight to go out of there. So I would have to wait. It so happened that it was on a Friday and that group of military who was gonna take care of orders worked Monday through Friday. And so we had a little crying spell and I says, well, getting toward four o'clock, is this your seat? He says, yes. I said, well, I am not getting out of this seat until somebody gives me some orders. And so they got the orders, but then the, 
I had an insurance agent that had come to me in Texas and she happened to live in San Francisco. So she's put me up, but she had to go away. And then she says, well, okay, we're gonna take you back over to the Presidio, go back over there. They gave me the orders. And she says, well, honey, $50 is not gonna do anything for you. It won't even, she'd already told me that that Friday night. You can't even get a hotel here. <laughs> for more than one night for $50. So they, she took me over and they put me up at the hospital. So for nine days, I stayed in a hospital bed until they got these orders ready for me. And then I found out that I was to be in Oakland and not in San Francisco. But by that time, what I wanted to do, the reason I told them I was sitting there until they do something was because I was on leave and your leave, that's a whole day's paycheck you're losing. So I told them, I'm, that's why I says, I'm sitting here until you stop it. You've got to put me on. They turned around and put me on orders to be in San, San Francisco so that that stopped the leave so I wouldn't lose that. And uh, they gave me an advance of $100, I think, of, from my pay so that I could buy lunch and do the stuff that I was supposed to do while I was there. So come time to go to Oakland, they the military did take the responsibility of getting me there. And uh, it was nice. This, that was going from the Army to the Air Force. And the Air Force gave me a nice bed to sleep in for the night. And uh, when my time took, I think I spent one night there or it was part of a night, and then you had to get up in the middle of the night to go to the plane. But as I was getting on the plane, I got on the plane, but then they pulled me right back off and says, there's some problem that you've got. You've not had your yellow fever shot. So I get pulled off the plane to get a yellow fever shot, and they put me back on the plane. But when you get on the plane, of course, you are female, and there was no such thing as women wearing pants in those days. There were no pants, so you had to travel in uniform at all times. And find that there were six women on this plane with however many men, however many seats they had, 100, 200 seats on a plane. And there were six of us, and you got to sit like this I don't know the person next to me, so you can't lean over on him go to sleep. So for 17 hours, that was kind of hard. <laughs> Civilian yeah. aircraft, though? Continental. Yeah. Stewardesses yeah. and serving you meals and the, the typical mm -hmm. routine? Yeah. But uh, filled with nothing but military people? Yes. Isn't it a bit surreal that you're going in combat in this civilian aircraft like that? Yeah, it seemed, but we were glad because we had seen pictures of the military aircraft. And so I was <laughs> glad that we didn't have to go on a military aircraft. And after your mm -hmm. saga of San Francisco and the Presidio and all, you had to be relieved of finally being on an airplane, I would think. Well, it happened, so happened that midair, we were told that we could not continue on. I think we were supposed to go into the Philippines the crew that was supposed to meet them were not going to be there, so we ended up in Hawaii. But by the time we landed in Hawaii, we were already too sleepy to even think about where we were. So again, you got to stay at Tripler Army Hospital. The fee they put the six females there. And for the first time, I had a full drink of alcohol. And so that's what the ladies told me to do. If you have a drink, you can go to sleep. And you, <laughs> when we get ready, we'll be ready to go. So Wait I took minute. my are, drink. Are you saying this is the first time that alcohol had ever passed your lips? That was the first time I'd ever had a full drink. I'd tasted it before, but I'd really never Maybe had a full drink. Wine? Oh, no, my church used grape juice. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, that's part of getting you ready to go to Vietnam, <laughs> I guess. Okay. So, so we stayed at Tripler at the hospital there for overnight. So I really didn't get to enjoy Hawaii because it was mostly just 
sleeping and getting ready for the rest of the trip. And then the flight from Hawaii was direct to Vietnam after that? Yes. Yes. Where did you land in Vietnam? Saigon. Tonsonut Air Base? Tonsonut, yes. And at that point, okay. it was, was no... Your, what was your first impression of Vietnam getting off that aircraft? Well, before we got off the aircraft, we were beginning to see little red flashes of things going down. As we were coming down, we were seeing things. And so they said, oh, those are just tracers. And at that point in time, I really didn't, I had never seen a tracer before, nor a picture of a tracer. But it did tell us that that was some kind of uh, firearm that was making the tracer. So that was a little scared. But as we landed, we landed into a aircraft hangar, which I'd never been in one of those. That's this great big building that's, and as far as you could see were little lizards over everything. And that was enough to take my thoughts off of the tracers, but the tracers were still coming. You were still hearing the noises. The airline hostess was saying, oh, it's not a big deal because they, they fly in and out. We hadn't thought about that, but I give credit to those civilian ladies. They they were seeing more than I'd ever seen, you know. So um, once we got there, and uh, it was probably 1.30 in the morning or whatever, but they were expecting us, the six females, and they put us up in rooms that were vacated by somebody who had gone off on R&R. &R. And again, I ended up in a room and I'm hearing these little sounds that I'd never heard before. And they were called Glecos. I asked, what is that? She says, oh, it's just a little Gleco. What is a Gleco? Now, when I was in Texas, I had seen lizards, but they were huge. But I hadn't seen these little things that were on the ceilings and the walls and everywhere. It was in a room. And I said, well, do they stay up there? No. Sometimes they'll fall down. So what happens if you get on the bed? You just kick them off. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, I got to sleep through this. But anyway, uh, that was a night to behold. And so by the next day, I was so sleepy. I didn't know what to do because I was on watch for geckos all night. And uh, I think... Some of the guys flying in there, they comment about the heat. Now, you came in in the middle of the night, and you'd been in El Paso, where it gets plenty hot. But they also sometimes comment about the smell of Vietnam. At that time, it didn't. I didn't smell a whole lot. The only thing was that there was so much going on. And it was like, what do you call it? Um, you were distracted. Well, not distracted, but you were hearing the, the sounds of the geckos. You're hearing the sounds of the bombs. You were hearing the sounds of all of the people who were there meeting you. And it was, at, at that point, I really felt protected again because being female and all of us were officers, they all come, they'd assign somebody to come and get your luggage or your duffel bag and take you to your room and that's what their thing was to immediately get us loaded up and transport it to where we were supposed to sleep for the night. But it sounds, based on your comments, like this was not what you had expected when you got there. I didn't know what to expect. They had, ex they had told us about what you're going to do after you're on the ground, but not so much arriving in. So it was... It was an interesting thing. Uh, I know that just in Texas, some of the lizards there, they said they they were big in Texas. And they may be bigger in Vietnam. And But the ones that we were seeing there were little and plentiful. So it was more like you can't run away from this one because when you run this way, there's about 40 over there, you know, and just like... You really didn't like these. No, I did not like those. And, uh, but anyway, I was prepared for the five days. It was called the Center for Overseas Replacements. So you were there with people who were 
getting ready to leave as well as the ones who are coming in. So then you're hearing the ones who are leaving, got to get out of this place. You know, this, this is, they were rejoicing that they were going back to the world. And here we were, and they were telling us all this goreness of why they needed to get out of there to go back to the world. And here I am coming from the world, going over there. So it was not exactly something for 22-year-old to deal with. Were you afraid for your safety after hearing all these stories and the first initial experiences? I was, yep. Yeah. It was, I was afraid for my safety, but I pulled out my 91st Psalm and started saying, thousands shall fall at my side, but it's not gonna hurt me. <laughs> and I just had to convince myself that this is the way it was gonna be. Um, you have a small Bible then you carried wherever you went? Mm-hmm, yeah. Where did you end up being assigned? I was at the 24th Evacuation Hospital which there was two evacuation hospitals in the area where I went, but that was about 15 miles away from Saigon. So to get from Saigon to there, you had to travel through where they say the land landmines might be and the drivers, but that's okay because the drivers are familiar and they they know the territory, but if anything happens, this is what you gotta do. We are Name, bus. rank, and serial number. Don't give up any more information. Were so. you on a bus during that trip? No, gee. Because even though there were six of us, we all ended up going someplace, six different places. So we all had our private Jeep. You went all by yourself with the driver and a Jeep? And your gear? Yeah. I think there were a driver and a, an assistant in me, yeah. but no other female. Were you sitting in the front or the back of the Jeep? The back. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. What was, and you were seeing lots of the countryside flow by. What was your impression of Vietnam seeing it from that perspective? It wasn't a pretty sight. <laughs> you were seeing people living in the water, you know, with they said, oh, that's a sandpan. It looked like a boat, but it was their house or whatever. You saw people washing clothes in the water, uh, drinking. They said they drink get the water. They wash in the water. They That's the thing. So you don't want to drink the water. So all I could think of was, where are we going to get it? You only drink water that the U.S. has provided and say that it's potable. Well, it's now I learned that the word is potable, but we called it potable. But, um, and it was in a canvas bag. I'd had my time of having a shower too. Uh, that was traumatic. Uh, you have to have a shower before, during the day when it heats up the water. And uh, while I was taking a shower, uh, a frog jumped up on me and I screamed. And the next thing you know is there I am with a shorty pajama and a towel and people, soldiers are running from everywhere. And they says, what's the matter, what's the matter? Where is it, where is it? And I keep pointing at the frog, but they were expecting that there was a, a Viet Cong had gotten through. And so they were got all these guns pulled out looking for this thing, other person and I was, it was really a frog, but the frog was this big and it hit me right here. And I was, I was there for five days and almost every half hour, somebody was laughing because there, there's that officer that scared of a frog. And I thought, oh, so it was embarrassing. That was in the replacement depot before you went up to the unit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot to live down. Maybe it was good that you're only there for five days. <laughs> <laughs> what was your reception like? Well, where was the 24th? Was that Long Bend? It's in Long Bend. What was your reception like once you got to the unit? Hmm. 
I, d I think they had a sponsor for me. They were expecting me. So there was a female who had been expecting me to come. There was the, my classmates from Tuskegee who had, I've kind of been following their trail. They had set it up for a military policeman. In fact, he came to the replacement station to meet me there. And they had set it up for these people to look out for me. And uh, I thought he was gonna be my big brother, but he wanted a girlfriend instead. And so that got to be a little bit of a trial. <laughs> but when I got to the 24th evac, they pretty much took me to my quarters where I was to be. And of course, you see in a building that had no no windows, but they had a screen. So it was the housing that was, they had just moved out of uh, tents. So I was kind of prepared and my anxiety was up to have to sleep in a tent, but they didn't, they had grown out of that already. So they had a real building, but it didn't have windows and had a door. And of course my sponsor, they usually, whenever you go in the in the Army Nurse School, they'll have somebody who's been there already to kind of put you at ease. And she um, was telling me about other, uh, most of the nurses would be gone out of the building at different times, so you make sure you lock your door when you're in there. And uh, we did have private rooms, so that was kind of, mine was close to the front door so I'd hear everybody who's coming in and I was across from the place that they had a refrigerator the did they have a latrine in the in the BOQ when I got there you would still had to go across the street um, to a burnout it's like a it was a building I mean a, a little house but it had a half of a five gallon drum with a, uh, kerosene in it. So you go there, but you'd have to go across the street. And so, why do they call it a burnout? Because when they, when it's filled up or when they, they're scheduled that it's enough in there, a truck would bring some soldiers would come and they would pick it up and they would take it to wherever they would set it afire and burn it. So. Well, maybe that's why I hear some of the stories about the distinctive smells of Vietnam. I think some of the distinctive smells was, that might have been a part of it because we used to get patients who got a little bit close, too close to the burnout. And so they come in with some of the contents of that thing in their skin as they were burned. Um, but some of it too was the Vietnamese people They'd have fish that they'd get out of the water and they'd lay them out somewhere to dry out. So I think some of that was some of the smell as well. And then they did not use the toilet facilities the way we do. And I think nobody had taught them how to cover the excreta after they made it in a little hole. And so, or they cover it too shallow. So you, some of the smell, I think, would come from there. Tell me more about the 24th, the evacuation hospital. What is the 24th mission? At the time that I was there, it was that a person, a soldier or an injured or an ill person may, we were supposed to be equipped to keep them there for up to 30 days. But the I'd, and then to either return them to duty or to send them on to the next station. Were these soldiers being medevaced straight in from the field oftentimes? Or were they passing through another medical facility first? Some t they were supposed to have gone to what they call an aid station, which is close to the field. So they used to have a medic to go to the person if they're injured, and then they go to a, an aid station and they should stabilize them enough to get them 
either transported by vehicle or hel helicopter and then to the 24th evac. By the time they would get to us, they should have been maybe with morphine on them because the medic would have done that if they were in lots of pain. But at, at times we would get them sent directly from the site of injury to the hospital and that we were not always expecting because that was, if they looked like they were not gonna be able to, the aid station was just to stabilize them to take the, the flight. But if they had helicopters to go directly and pick them up, then they would bring them directly to us. And uh, we had been told that during the Korea War, they may have lost 20%, but the goal was to have 5% of to persons to live. So if they got to us, then we were to keep them alive. So that would have been the pressure on us in the, as well that if they come here, you're supposed to keep them alive. Either you get them ready to go to Japan or to the Philippines or somewhere in between, out of this, out of the country. Um, Were you getting soldiers who had life-threatening uh, injuries? Oh yes. And would you <laughs> evac them out more quickly? Most of the time, if they were really life-threatening, then we would keep them until they were more able to travel. So the idea is to get them stable enough to make a trip. And so sometimes we would end up keeping them long-term, like up to 30 days. And we were getting more and more uh, sophisticated with time because they would actually, if we had the somebody there had the ability to communicate back to the United States and tell them what we were getting. So we didn't have to always give a report as to what kinds of patients we had, what condition they were in. And sometimes they would fly over a crew, maybe a research crew or technical crew from Washington, D.C., who maybe if they had a piece of equipment that they were to use and they knew we couldn't use, didn't know what to do with it, they would send a crew over and uh, they would walk us through it. Um, and we got more and more sophisticated as we went through. Did but, you have the whole range of medical or specialties on staff? The attempt was to have them. Uh, we, we had lots of facial injuries, so we had the maxillofacial doctors. We had lots of head injuries, so we had the neurologist. Um, we had the physical therapist and occupational therapist who, if we got them well enough, they could start the therapy right there. Um, we, what we found that we had less of was enough nurses and corpsmen to deal with that. Um, we worked 12 hour shifts, six days a week. Um, I might have been the only nurse on duty with four, three or four corpsmen for the night shift, and we had about 20 patients all hooked up with IVs, mouth wired up, uh, lots of different things that would have been there. But at that place, we'd have like an intake, like an emergency room. Then we'd have a operating room. We have a recovery room, and mine was like after they'd been through the recovery, overcome, aw awaken from anesthesia, then they would come to me. So I would have the them all over the longer period. Okay. But you sounds like you would have seen just about everything that you had to deal with. Uh, I think the motto was anything that grows, you'll see it in Vietnam. Any body part that one has, you will see it in Vietnam. And I think I did. So was your particular ward, was it specializing in any kind of an injury? We used to say it was everything except OB and pediatrics, but that went away too because we ended up with the newborn baby there one day. Um, but we had mostly, it was called general surgery. 
So we'd have everything from paraplegics, uh, people who could not move any limbs, uh, jaws closed so they couldn't eat, uh, tracheotomies, they couldn't talk, uh, the breathing, chest tubes, the chest may have been filled up with fluids, so you'd have to monitor chest tubes. Uh, in fact, I actually had to put one in at one point to save a life um, because there was just so much that came in. And that was the big thing about Vietnam. Some days you might be at a point that you know what's that everything you can sort it out and plan for it and then all of a sudden you might get two helicopters coming in because they couldn't make it to the next stop they had to stop there and you'd end up with more patients than you ever expected so Tell me, who were the mm -hmm. patients is this exclusively americans that you were dealing with at our hospitals we did dealt with americans and um the enemy but we had what they call the POW ward. And I was, being a new nurse, I was not to work on the POW ward. It had to be a strong, experienced individual to work there because you had some decisions to make that young, they wouldn't expect me to make it being as new to nursing as I was. but. We eventually would get there, but they had a special ward and they used some psychological operations and things like that that they wanted to find out from the enemy what was going on. We knew what was going on there, but we didn't really work there. They had a pretty skilled set of people working there because in addition to taking care of the injuries, they also wanted to get information. So they were being interrogated. Mm -hmm. Were you hearing stories about the methods of interrogation? The methods sounded reasonable to me. I mean, they would just ask questions. If they wake up and they can talk, then they would just, sometimes they would be, they don't want to leave the hospital because they know they're getting good care, so they would volunteer some good information. Were there any rumors about torture? No, not there. Ours, I, I'm positive they were not torturing at the hospital. Were you uh, working with any Arvin soldiers, uh, Army of Vietnam, Southern, South, South Vietnamese soldiers? Yeah, we would get them in, but they would be blended in with the, the American soldiers. I mean, because they were friendly. Okay. And then we'd, sometimes we'd have civilians, um, both American civilians that we had contractors there and people who were doing some big sophisticated work out there. And then we would also sometimes get the um, South Vietnamese civilians. I want to finish, we got to take a break here pretty soon, but I want to finish with one of the stories you had mentioned to me before um, about a soldier who came in that you weren't able to identify who it was. Yeah. Yeah. Our, we have been trained for this, <laughs> but it was like when they come in and you don't know, any soldier that comes in, he gets tagged with his name, his ID, and that, that was why we were supposed to wear the ID. The dog tags, one goes in his mouth if he's dead, and another one, the other ones is just there for identification. This particular one did not have him at all because they made noise, and that would attract the enemy to them. So a lot of times they didn't wear the dog tags because they didn't want to draw attention to where they were. and. Uh, I don't know if I should say his name, but I did. we did find out his name later. But his name was, we call him UNK. And so you have to report back how many of those that you had. And the word went out all over the place where this UNK was. So somebody who was miss a commander that was missing somebody would come looking for them. But for days, nobody came looking for this one but they eventually did come and he was identified. But he was, not only was he, he was unknown and they become unknown because they cannot speak and cannot tell you who they are. And so he was out, uh, I mean, he, 
unconscious. And but we got him to a point that he could move. I had him most of the time. And uh, I think he was paralyzed from neck down. So we had to turn him every two hours and that and try to see if there's any responsiveness that would come out where he could tell us who he was. He would eventually try, but he still couldn't tell us. And that was painful because we wanted somebody to know who he was and we wanted to connect him with somebody. And eventually we did, but he had malaria. And uh, a part of that, we had another set of wards where because he had malaria, I needed to send him away from, it was like across the compound. And they had him over there um, to keep the other patients that I had from getting because mosquitoes were pretty bad there too. So we had to put him where he could be away from the other patients and and the nurses there knew how to deal with the ma malaria. But he was, he died before he left there. It's gotta be very emotionally challenging for you to deal with a patient like that, I would think. It was. And I mean, I think a part of it too is sometimes we would actually, even after you work your 12 hours, you just kind of sit beside his bed, um, try to see if he'll wake up while the other nurses, you know, the day shift or the, the next shift, they're busy doing what they have to do. Just sit there and and see if you can get that name out of him. And so when this commander came there, that was like a godsend. Have so we were so cautioned, glad. Cautioned not to get too emotionally attached to the, the patients that you were working with? Yeah, in fact, they taught us that at Tuskegee. <laughs> put, your feelings on the, put your feelings on the floor and just step on them. And, but that was better said than done better say it than done. Well, that's a good place for us to take a quick break, and we'll be back shortly with another session. Okay. Connie, we're back from our quick break. Got a chance to stretch our legs and get a sip of water. Uh, let's go back. We got plenty more to talk about your experiences in the hospital there, and uh, I wonder if you can explain to us or tell us about the conditions you had to work in the hospital themselves. Okay. Let's start with an obvious. Was it air conditioned? It was not air conditioned at first, but later on we did get air conditioning. And I assume this is not in a tent. These are in fixed buildings. No, it was not a fixed building. It was called a Quonset hut, which is a metal that's a half circle on concrete. And the beds were regular army cots. cots but they were high enough that we could work with them, but they were not hospital beds. They were just army cots. And, uh, and there you took care of the patients, but I had about 20 of them on the floor where I worked. And so the nurse's desk would have been centered where we could get to them. In the center of the, of the Quonset hut? In the center of my 20 patients, so you'd have the nurse is in the middle and then you got two rows that way and two rows this way so you can keep your eye on everybody at the same time. No matter what I was doing, I could still keep an eye on every person. So if you went from the operating room to a ward, you were going outside and traveling between corridors? No, we had, a little, we had a little corridor that went from those wards uh, down. So they, but once they got into my section, that was mine. It was just they had the little breeze hallway. I'm thinking a quantum hut there. in the heat without air conditioning, that couldn't have been pleasant for anybody working there. No, it wasn't. They had doors, but they quickly got them in there. Uh, but the strange thing is they did the POWs first. They had air conditioning before we had it on the American side because they said the International Red Cross required it, that the POWs have air conditioning. Hmm. How did you feel about the POWs being there? Did you look on them as enemies or as patients? We looked on them pretty much as patients. 
Um, Did you have any personal experience working with him later on? I didn't. But except you you didn't know who you had anyway, because they, sometimes they would come in just in a black pajama. That's that's the pants. And the enemies, uh, most of the Arvins would have had some kind of little uniform on. But if they came in that black pajama, you would figure that might be an enemy. Those so we be would, a con. Yeah, we would call in the intelligence people to figure out who they were. And of course, a couple times we did ship one of them that I had out to the POW ward. How about uh, North Vietnamese soldiers? Did they have any of those? Well, those were the enemy. Well, but you had Viet Cong, which were the local guerrillas, and then you had the North Vietnamese regulars who would have been in uniform. Did you have any North Vietnamese in uniform? I never saw, I didn't have any on my floor anyway. Okay. Um, did you have a chance then to work, were there Vietnamese civilians working in the hospital? Yeah. We had, they had been cleared by the U.S. intelligence to work with us, and they were pretty much our interpreters. And then they would also work with, um, do little tasks for us. Um, the only one I can remember having was Zumi, and she was very very close to us, but they worked a shift with the nurses, and then they would go home. I don't, we didn't have any of them uh, overnight. Did you ever have any reason to be suspicious of them? Oh yeah, we were suspicious of everybody. Um, but after a while you got to hear that conversation and that know that they were not, you know, we could hear tell from their conversation that they were not. And then, of course, in our hooches, we had, we call them mama sons. They were assigned to uh, kind of tidy up our rooms and do our laundry. And those we weren't so sure about. Tell me more about Zumi. Is that her name? Zumi? That's all I knew. Zumi. Mm -hmm. What was special about Zumi? She said she was a nurse. She had been trained in France, and she came back home, and uh, the U.S. had cleared her, and so she was working with us, um, pretty much caring for patients as we needed, or she'd go, and go out, because we had to, any water we used was outside. She'd go and bring water in so that we can give somebody a bath, um, and she'd keep the area clean. She speak English? She spoke some. We find out that it was easier for us to teach them English than it was for us to learn Vietnamese. <laughs> well, I assume she learned, she knew French too, but. It was strange that their French was strange because she told me that there was a dialect of French because I knew a little bit myself, but she could understand some, but she told me the older people would not and I found out that that was true, that even though they spoke French, they it was that depends on where they lived and their little groups. And some of them didn't understand each other, even though they said they were speaking French. It sounds like, though, you had a much closer relationship with her than most of the rest of the Vietnamese in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. Because there's, there's something special about her or just because oh, she was she was, she was just assigned to my floor. She was assigned to my ward. So you had more opportunity to get to know her better. Oh yeah, she worked with us every day. Well, let's get you, not when you're working, but some of the other experiences. You already told us about your BOQ, such as it was. Uh, was there a mess hall or a dining facility that you habitually used? Yeah, there was, and it was on the compound with us there. Everything is like, well, we call it a compound, all these little buildings there, and they got a walkway between them. And the dining hall was pretty strategically placed so that you can go from your living quarters and the dining hall would be there. And then for, for the people who were working, they could come into the dining hall. But it was like you've got a tray. The big thing about mess hall, every Monday morning, you're going to get your malaria pill. And you had to take that malaria pill before you went anti-malaria pill. You'd have to take it before you could get your breakfast. 
and you had to sign your name that you took it. So they were very peculiar. I mean, you didn't want any of us getting the malaria because if one got it, everybody could be subjected to it. So we took that, and it would cause uh, some abdominal problems uh -huh. and some frequency to the bathroom and stuff like that. So we get that in your mess hall tray. It was just a tray that had little compartments on it, so you got whatever you're going to get. And uh, our meals were... I hated the days of SOS. Some of the people really liked it. SOS is some kind of ground beef with a white sauce. But SOS stood for something entirely different in the, the vernacular of the soldier. Oh, same old... Well, I'm not going to say I'll the say other it. one. <laughs> Shit on a shingle. <laughs> and the problem I had with it was some most of the patients that I had had a tracheotomy, and sometimes they would cough, and i go, you know, hit you in the face. A couple of times I went in there with it, and somebody, I had a spot on my face that one of the patients had coughed up his cough and left it on my face. And... Uh, we were worried that the some of that could have gotten down into the SOS. So uh -huh. I didn't eat SOS anymore after that. <laughs> but you always had hot meals, it sounds like. Oh, we had hot meals, yeah. And the cafeteria, uh, I spent a lot of time in the cafeteria, too. Because when you get off of your 12-hour shift, if it's too noisy for the night, you're not going to go to sleep anyway. So I spent a lot of from 11 to about 3 o'clock in the morning in the in the mess hall with the cooks, and they'd let me peel potatoes or do whatever they were doing or make pies. <laughs> it was relaxing to help the cooks then? It was relaxing to have somebody around that I didn't have to go back in that room by myself. Wow. So, Did the um, Post have an officer's club? They had an officer's club, and it was right next door to where we lived. And that was, you'd do all your little dances, and they'd bring in some uh, American soldiers that gotten together and made up a band, and they would come in, and they'd play music, and you'd go and have some drinks. And Well, you had your first drink in Hawaii. Did you have more after that then? I was a little cautious about it, but I still had, I would have one every now and then because it was like if when you're working 12 hours, um, and you're tired, one drink could make you sleep longer than you're supposed to, so I just stayed away from it. Um, Kool-Aid was a big deal because you didn't want to, the water, even though it was purified and potable, you didn't want to drink it, so they would always have Kool-Aid, and I don't, I haven't drunk Kool-Aid since I came back from there. Um, well, I'm kind of hitting off a, a lot of different subjects, but I wondered if you had a chaplain on staff as well. Yeah, we had a chaplain, and that was a close friend of ours. He did services on Sunday morning, but he always would walk around and see if there was anybody who needed anything, and I spent plenty of time with the chaplain. In fact, I my most memorable experience with them was we he took me into the morgue and we kind of dealt with what was in those bags that were in there and they had sometimes you would get a bag of limbs that you didn't know what to do with but we had to preserve them anyway and we took them back but I was not on grave dis I mean it was right there by us so he'd take me in there and we spent a little time and and deal with who was in there, what was there, and that kind of thing. And in an official capacity, doing what nurses were required to do with the deceased, I assume. Yeah. But why was the but some of it going was... in there with you then? Because it was such a, a traumatic experience to, to help you in, in that respect? Yeah, we processed what was what was going on, the fact that these people who were there in these bags had families back home, and we looked at a few of them once, but I told them that was enough. I now know that somebody is there, and we 
treated them with dignity because they had to stay there until they were able to be put out to the next spot. Usually if they came in on the helicopter and they were dead on arrival, they would probably already have been bagged. Uh, if we had to take one in, which I only lost the one person, I lost the baby while I was there. And the, the unknown soldier, he went someplace else, so I really didn't have to deal with processing him to go into that room. But he let us know how dignified that they were treating them when they were in the room and they weren't just thrown over into a corner and stuff like that, which was questions that I had come up with, was how protective were they of the deceased once they put them in there. So he just went in with me to show me how dignified that they were treated. How important was your faith to you going through that experience? It was very, very uh, important. But I think the part that we processed was even if we didn't think they were going to heaven, we would pray for them to have uh, done whatever they needed to do to do that. And then we also prayed that the soldiers who were out, still out there, would make a decision that they would, to get to heaven, they would have had to go this way. But we wanted them to also be um, prepared for it because not everybody goes there just because you die. And so we prayed for the ones who had not yet gotten injured to uh, make those decisions while they were out there, even though they didn't hear us. They, we prayed for them. Would you, did you actually talk to your patients sometimes about your faith? I did, yeah. Because sometimes they would ask. You know, they'd ask me, do you think I'm going to die? And I would say, I don't know that. But from what I see here, we're going to get you prepared. You're going to go back home. You're going to do, you're going to be all right. But if there's anything that you want to know, We'll talk about it. And I think um, I would load them up on a gurney, which is the little bed that will on wheels, and I would take them to chapel because we had a space in the chapel where when they had services, they could go and they could hear the singing and the praying and the sermon that would be going on, and they would be okay with that. Did the whole experience, you think, strengthen your faith or lead you lots of questions or maybe both? Oh, it, str it strengthens my faith. I mean, I was not about to let that go because I had gone there prepared that that's what was going to make a big difference to me. And then when I found that the patients were drawing off of me, I found that it was more important because as a part of what I had to give, I had to, if they asked me about faith, and if they thought they were weak at all, then I needed to be strong enough and prepared enough to help them through what they needed to. Did you have a, a cross on that was visible when you were working with the patients? No, we were not allowed to wear anything okay. other than uniform. <laughs> but the chaplain certainly was, I would think. The chaplain did. I mean, his that's his insignia. His insignia was the cross. My insignia was a caduceus with an N on it, so that's all I wore. Okay. Different subject then, and that's about how much you were able to get off base and, and see Vietnam on your own. I really did not. Uh, one time I went into the city, into Benoit. A couple of the nurses just so happened that three of us were black. And the kids were running around us looking for, they were looking for Mama Son's tail because they had been taught that Black people had tails. And then they would look at me and they would look at me and say, Mama San ain't saying me, but Mama San's eyes this way. And so they were trying to figure out how could I be same, same them on skin, but my eyes were not like theirs. But they were more intrigued with finding out what happened to our tail. And then some of the other kids would come and say, Mama San chose sister. So we would figure if they were gonna call us the soul sister, we could tell the ones that had been around the black soldiers and the ones that had been around the white soldiers. So that got to be kind of fun to just do. But I only did that twice. 
um, because after that, things got so hot that it was not very far you could go. Benoit was supposed to be okay because that's where the airfield was, so that was fairly protected. But because we were so busy, yeah. the whole time I was there, there was not very far we could go. I went to Saigon once, that's the 15 miles away, and then a, co a couple of times we went on what they call a med cap, medical action program or something. Anyway, it was some, when you were off duty, you could go out into the village and you could do some kind of service, healthcare service with the people, like teach a little bit, put a Band-Aid on them, give them some candy or whatever. Um, I did that once, and that was traumatic because on the way back, one of the guys had taken us out illegally, he said, on a airboat, and the person who had actually taken us out before we could get back to the hospital, we heard over the radio, the police, because the MPs, the military police had taken us out there, that soldier was found uh, in the airboat was lifeless. And what had happened was that he rode through some kind of airboat heck, I think, beheaded him. And so by the time we got back to the hospital, he came into the same hospital where we were. And they had already been looking for the nurses and because they knew that we went out there. And we had to confess that we had been in that boat. But when we saw him, we realized that was the driver of the airboat. <laughs> well, I got all uh, kinds of questions. And this has got to be difficult for you to talk about. So I appreciate your willingness to do this. But what was your, what was your feelings about the Vietnamese that you encountered? Did you like them, the civilians? We did. I did. The ones that we worked with, the ones that were there, but sometimes they did things that, well, we didn't like it that they would, when they would go to the bath, they're used to squatting when they go to the bathroom. After a while, we had a toilet seat, not not a real toilet seat, but the wood, it was built up off the ground, and a couple times we would go in and they would be squatting there, so they would leave little sprinkles, and we didn't like that. And people were always yelling at them, but when they would go out, even though we had the toilet, they would be out in front of the toilet doing their business. But what I learned later on was that that was, that, that was the only time they had to talk to each other. So to do that business in that little open space was their time to get to talk to each other. But we didn't like them doing what they did over there. But then when they would clean our house um, and wash our clothes, we wanted to pay them what we thought it was worth. And we really could not, we were told we could not pay them what we thought it was worth. So why? I, because they told us it was set at 300 piastres a day, which to us translated into less than a dollar. And because if they got more money than the V, the Viet Cong outside would know that they had this money and they would never end up using it themselves. And so some of them would be beat and the money would be taken away from them. So that was a restraint that not to give them what we thought it was worth, but the government, our government had said, this is what it's worth to keep them from being in trouble. It's a complicated situation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I would imagine it was yeah. easy for some of the GIs to disrespect the uh, the Vietnamese people. Did you see any of that? I saw a lot of that. Some of it to their demise. demise. A um, couple of them that had worked with me, they were, I think they got comfortable enough to go out into the economy alone or maybe they went out with another buddy, but they would separate and go to somebody's house. And uh, one of the worst ones that we had was a soldier. He didn't work directly with me, but he was going to have to have a peniectomy. And it was because he had gone out and contracted one of the venereal diseases that 
was incurable and he was going to lose his body part. And on another occasion, I pulled up the sheet and there was body part on another patient in the bed because he had progressed to that point where it just lost it. And we did not know what to do with that particular disease. But we were sure that most of them had been through the same training that I had been through and they were told not to go out there, but they went anyway. So it was kind of hard to be sympathetic with them and care for them at the same time, but then you knew you had to do it. So. You, uh, we talked about uh, caring for the, the uh, injured. You remember the, your first time you, you saw a really serious injured soldiers being flown in, your, your feelings, your, your experiences then? Well, the first thing was that you got to go out. There was a couple times when we had to actually run across the street to the helipad and help to bring in the injury injured because the people who came in with them, there weren't sufficient numbers of them. So you have to go out there and help to bring them in. But you took them to what we call the emergency area where they would be triaged. Um, and you always under you can't go out there and become a casualty because when the helicopter blades are turning, uh, the blade could hit you and you would become a casualty. And in fact, I had an American civilian that I did have to take care of that had gotten hit with one of those helicopter blades. So that was, that was hard to try to protect yourself as well as going to get somebody else to bring in to help them. But you kind of knew that if you become a casualty, there'd be a whole lot of casu casualties out there that wouldn't have anybody to take care of them. So it got to be sensible and, and manageable. I guess what I'm wondering, though, is there a process that you and everybody who's working there has to go through of dealing with these very traumatic injuries and being repulsed by them, and then over time you, you learn how to deal with that? You learn how to deal with it as you go. And I think one of the blessings that I had when I was there, we were working so fast. I mean, it was so busy. I was there during what they say was the height of the war. And we were so busy that half the time you didn't have time to think about how I feel about what's going on. You just get to move on to the next one. But then when it comes down to, there was a point where we weren't so busy. I think it was the Christmas night, I believe. We will actually had time to go see a movie. and But there you were thinking about what you're seeing the next day. But all of a sudden there was a mass casualty coming in and you had to drop those crazy thoughts. And that's what I was finding that when I came back home, that people had pushed back so much of what needed to be processed right now and it was coming back 15, 20 years later. And uh, that I found, I had to go and sit with some other nurses to see why it was some of them were having most difficult time and I was not. And some of it seemed like it was, they had a slower pace going on. So they were processing that all the time that they were there but then they get to a point where they couldn't process it and then it was coming up. But when I got back, they actually sent me through a little, they call it a simulation of Vietnam to bring back some of the old smells and the old scents and all that. And then they could figure out where I was stuck. And this was in Chicago Heights and they kind of helped me through some of that. You had just mentioned that you were there during the height of the war. Do you remember occasions where your compound, where the hospital was actually fired upon, took incoming rounds? That was, they weren't incoming rounds, it was incoming people. Uh, on the morning after Tet, 
well, the stuff began, was going I think, on. on January 31st, 1968, the, the Lunar New Year, mm -hmm. and it's the most important battle of the Vietnam mm -hmm. War. So. Mm -hmm. And some of the people, what was going on, the ammo dump was close by us, and it. I think the U.S. intentionally blew up some of the ammunition because they were coming in and that that's what they wanted, and they blew it up so they couldn't get to it. So that noise was there. And they were reporting that all over the compound, little Vietnamese were coming up out of the ground because they had tunneled through from wherever they were, from Hanoi maybe, and they were just resurfacing there. And our hospital was supposed to be their rest stop as they were on their way to Saigon. And so we were seeing some of that little activity going on, which we didn't expect. But some of it we did because, and we were, I was angry with the U.S. because our intelligence, some, a lot of times the intelligence would have told you that on this particular night at 9 o'clock, this is what's going to happen. And you figure, if you know it's going to happen, why, do, why aren't we out there ready to stop it from happening? But usually it would happen just the way they had told us and just about the same time that they had told us. So we, I still haven't figured that one out. What happened? Did, did you have a helmet and a, a gas mask with you when you were in the wards? Yeah, yeah. Were you wearing a helmet most of the time you were working? No, we, we just have it somewhere you can grab it if you need it to because this that thing is hot and cumbersome and all that. So... You don't really wear it. And then for the gas mask, I had a gas mask attached to all the patients' um, beds. So I only put my gas mask on once. I put it on because I was attempting to go and mask up all the patients, and somebody screamed at me, you got to mask yourself first. And so I did that. So we did it. What was the occasion that the And then patients... some doctor ran in and took my mask. So I would have been in bad shape. <laughs> Because <laughs> he needed a mask? Mm -hmm. Wow, that was very thoughtful. <laughs> Why were the patients needed to be masked at the time? Was there some kind of an attack? or? We were expecting that there was okay. one, yeah. Wow. That was the beginning of the tet. Was there a bomb shelter that you could go to to protect yourselves? They had a, what did we call them? Bunker. There was a bunker outside of where the females lived. And so whenever they would say that there's going to be this incoming, I, I can't remember the, the colors, but they would tell you whether you were on yellow, red, or whatever, whatever alert you were on. And the sounds would go off and you'd have to get to the bunker. And uh, we had a little ditty bag that the Red Cross had made for us with your toilet paper and your chewing gum and little things that you might need. So you'd run there, and I think I spent two nights in the bunker. Hmm. Well, what do you do with all the patients? I was not on duty. If you're on duty, then you've just got to stay there with them. and They're not going into a bunker? No, it's too many of them. Mm -mm. So as you recalled, are you saying that there was never a time that the hospital area came under attack other than the, the threat of sappers coming in? Not mine, not mine. It was supposed to be a law that if there's a Red Cross on the building, they were not supposed to attack it. But the first nurse that was killed in Vietnam was in one of those, and even though it had the Red Cross on, they were still attacked. She died on duty. Mm -hmm. After Tet, that was such a traumatic experience back in the United States because the American public was led to believe that we were winning the war. And suddenly you have this, and most military people said it was a re resounding victory, that the Viet Cong and the NVA suffered serious defeat. But politically, it was a victory for the, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. Did you start to have more serious doubts about what was going on in the war after that? No, I don't think it was that Tet. It was might have been the one that the next year. <laughs> 69. When, 69, yeah. Mine was 68. That is the main Tet. Yeah, that was the main one. But 
because we continued to go on, we figured we had one. Uh, that was, you know, their intent was to take over our hospital. And I left that hospital intact in August of 68 when I left there. So I figured they didn't get what they came to get. Not that night anyway. <laughs> okay. Wanted to spend some more time and talk a little bit about the experience of being a nurse, an attractive young lady in this environment of lots of men not only the doctors and the corpsmen there, but all these soldiers as well. Do you have any reflections on what that was like for you? It was weird. Uh, I think, well, first my friends that they had left there and I was supposed to be that little sister wanted a little girlfriend. Um, and then I had a boyfriend who went over with me and he found me there. Uh, he was far away. He was a Vietnamese interpreter. Um, but the ones who were there, it was like, oh, we haven't had a, we haven't seen a round eye in years or whatever. And uh, they would look for me. And then when they send these letters to the captain black nurse and they would give it to me because somebody had been there at the hospital or whatever and they saw me and I would get them, I get the letters. But I also got some request from some people because they heard that there was this easygoing lady over there. I don't know, but they came to me and I thought, got the wrong person. But that's what they would do when they would come because they, I mean, there's a bunch of, I think the most concentration of females was at the hospitals. And so that's where they would come. Um, the photographer there had taken my picture and I was hearing people saying, so-and-so has your picture and says that you're his girlfriend. And I'm thinking, what is this? But the photographer was actually selling my pictures. So anybody who went into his shop could get the picture. Sure would like to see that picture. You probably don't have it anymore. It might be in that thing that I gave. Oh, excellent. No? Were there any particular... Uh, no, it's not. It's not there. I had to find it. Any particularly embarrassing moments you had with the patients in that regard? Yeah. I was 22, and they were 18 to 25. And when you have to put in a catheter, and I mean, I can hold the place where I'm supposed to put the catheter, but sometimes it would stand up on its own. <laughs> and so that would be embarrassing. <laughs> Maybe they didn't need the catheter after all. Well, they did. <laughs> yeah, some of this might have not been what you expected when you signed up initially, huh? Yeah. Well, I'd had that experience once before I went over, so I was kind of almost aware of it, and I thought I had done what was necessary to do because, I mean, I don't think we were looking all that attractive because at some point, I mean, you were just about as dirty as some of them, so... You just kind of thought, well, I'm not attractive at all, but it wasn't attraction. I think it was something else going on there. And I recall when we <laughs> first talked about this, you also talked about a patient who had a serious injury in his face, that he essentially had lost his face. I wonder if you're willing to tell me a little bit more about that patient. Mm -hmm. He is, I have lost contact with him, but at the time that he came in, I happened to be nosing around at the emergency room and when he came in we saw this person that's face looked like a dirty mop it's just stringy 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 and then after the next day when i went to work i got him as a patient but i didn't see him i couldn't see his face because by that time he'd gone to surgery they pulled him together the most that they could uh and he was wrapped completely uh, in bandages. And so he would ask me if he was ugly, and I told him I couldn't see him because he was all bandaged up. And first I told him, you're not ugly. And he said, well, if I'm not ugly, would you kiss me? So I kissed him, but I said, but you're not going to feel it because he was all bandaged up. So he said, you didn't kiss me, so I kissed his hand. And uh, after a while, I taught him how to 
communicate because he wanted to talk all the time, but he couldn't talk because he lost half of his tongue as well. And he had a trach, so he couldn't speak. But I taught him how to write, and we had paper and a pen. And he'd gone through a ream of paper, and he stayed with us long enough that somebody was going out to Hawaii or Japan, and they brought back this magic uh, slate. And so when he got a hold of that, he just was communicating. He'd ask a question, and then you got to answer. He could hear, but he couldn't talk. And so um, I met him again um, in Washington, D.C. And I recognized him when I saw him. And television crew saw him when they came and they wanted to know how would I know. And I thought he was with the operating room, the emergency room nurse at the time. And it just, just knew that was him. But when I got to Chicago, they were talking about this faceless man that the VA would not do his surgeries because they thought it was cosmetic. And I did. I just heard about it. I just knew that was Leroy. And then we, we go out and uh, about in 1993, I was contacted by ABC Television in, in um, Washington State. They sent people out there that they wanted me to go and talk with him. And so he had about 200 so surgeries later, he could then speak and he could swallow on his own. And they did an interview with him and then uh, I gave him a kiss. Yeah, so. That had to be a special moment. Yeah, and he was living by himself and getting around, and he used his CB radio. But the thing that was touchy to me was that his brother was a teenage, younger than him, and the brother had just cracked up and had lost it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see, I, I didn't see his brother because his brother was just out of it. But he did. The brother did send me a, a bouquet. Couple more questions about your experiences in Vietnam, then I'm going to get you back home. Uh -huh. um, did you encounter any more incidents of discrimination or prejudice while you were in Vietnam? Let's see. It was the morning that Martin, we heard that Martin Luther King had been killed. April of 68. Yeah. And one of the people who I had become We'd gone through basic together. Uh, thought we could have been pretty good friends. His comment was, all we got to do now is to get rid of Rap Brown and Stokey Carmichael. And it was really, the, the cafeteria was extremely tense that morning. And I just picked up a meal tray and I hit him across the head with it. Well, they were about to get me and send me over to the LBJ <laughs> because I did that. But he came to my rescue and said, no, 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 no. I know this girl too well. <laughs> Should have kept my mouth shut. And so he kept me from getting into big trouble on that one. Do you have any patients who had a problem with you as a black nurse working with them? I had one that was on a circle bed. Well, this was where he was paralyzed from neck down, couldn't move himself. And he told me he didn't think that, he didn't want no black nurse taking care of him. And I told him, look, I am the only one here and your little soul got to get turned over here to keep you from getting bed sores and your circulation from getting going. And this is what you've got to do. And he was insisting that he was not going to let me do what I needed to do. And I said, look, you are not dying on my watch. So either you can't move a thing, so away you gonna go. And I just went ahead and did what I needed to do. I turned him over like he was supposed to be. And so he was still groaning while I had him face down. I says, okay, two hours later, you're gonna come back up. And he was still yakking. And I says, I don't care what you say, you are not dying on me. So that was it. But he was insistent he did not want a black person to take care of him. 
well, what's got it going through your head when you have a situation like that? I mean, you've expressed some of it already, but there's got to be a lot of resentment that you've got towards that patient. Well, I just figured the boy didn't know where he was, and I just figured he was a little mentally underrated about then, because if he was dying or could have died and he was going to resist getting it, I told him my military career was on the line and he was not dying because that was one of the things we had. If you get him here alive, keep him alive if you can. And that's what I was intending to do. And so I, don't, I didn't see him at, anymore after that. Well, let you get, let's get you back home. Tell me about at August of 68, it sounds like you came back home. Yeah. Walk me through that process. Well, one of my patients had written to me and he wanted to meet me at Travis when I, the Air Force Base when we came back in and he was gonna take me out to lunch. But when he came back, well, in addition to folk throwing eggs at us and stuff like that as we got off the plane or came out onto the streets, because you had to come out and buy your ticket to wherever you're gonna be going. Um, he came, he was there and he came with his parents and he says, well, I guess I can't go to lunch with you. And his parents didn't say anything to me, but he says, my parents won't take you out to lunch because you're black. And I said, well, did you tell your parents why you wanted to take me out to lunch? And he says, yeah, but I got to live with them. And he was still in his cast and things like that, so let him go. Did these incidents that we've just been talking about make you think about the whole reason for being in Vietnam in the first place and about all the things that still weren't right about what was going on in the United States? Yeah, it made me think about it. I, I really, But after I couldn't talk to his parents, I just figured it was just a lost cause because I figured I needed to talk to his parents and just tell them, <laughs> We brought your son, I sent your son back home to you, you know? Can't you just let this go, you know? And if he thought, I mean, I I told him, I, do you see any white nurses around here that you wanted to take out to lunch? He says, no. I said, just tell your mama that black people will take care of you, and that's it. <laughs> and he they drove off. You've had a full life after you came back from the United States. Did you have any difficulties readjusting? I mean, now we hear so much about PTSD. Did you find yourself having any struggles in that respect? I had some, but I didn't know that I was having some. <laughs> Would you kind of give us an inkling of that when we were talking before? Tell me more about that situation. Which one? Well, when you were talking about having to go through that simulated experience in Vietnam to help you, I don't know, decompress perhaps? Yeah, yeah. But that didn't happen until 1985. I came back in 1968. So I didn't go through the decompression until about 80. It was in the 80s because when they realized when we had started getting together as Vietnam veterans, they were figuring out something is not right here. A lot of the black people, soldiers were getting bad discharges and they asked me to come and talk to them. And they just wanted to hear my background and to see if I would, had a similar background to some of the black ones. And so the person who was leading, he says, you got PTSD, you need to come over. No, you got the same problem they got because they hadn't really come up with the name. So I went over and he says, I need you to come in there and I want, to, I want you to go back through Vietnam for us. And so they had this little room that's set up for um, to bring back memories because they figured if you've suppressed them, you need to do something to bring them back up and so, and so that you know what you're dealing with. And so they did, but that kind of brought up some things for me and a lot of it was the smells that were in that room and the jungle-like feeling that you were in. Um, but 
the strongest flashback that I had had been in the 70s, and I had told them about it. And in Chicago, they had a, a commuter train crash just at the work hour time. And all I could think of was it was still going on while I was driving to work. I was working at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, I wanted to go across, but it was going, I would have had to cross over Lakeshore Drive to get there to help to triage. And just about the time that it came, helicopters came in. I turned around. I, I didn't think that I had a flashback per se, but I just, I, I looked at help is on its way. And when I told somebody about that, they thought that it was the flashback. That's what they reported in the news was that I had this flashback. And that's when my friend decided that I should go through the simulation over there to see so we can bring it out. But that's, uh, is that the reason that they thought that you had some symptoms, that particular experience? Well. Were there other things that they were seeing from you as well that were suggesting it? Uh, after we were, I got a little frustrated when they wanted to do the parade and people were saying, go, why don't you guys get over this? And I would get mad because they would, uh, blaming the victim. That's what I thought it was. It was, you, you're pretty much blaming the victim rather than we're the ones who just can't get over it. And you guys are all straight. But what I was seeing was that they were more messed up than I was. And by the time, even my, I wasn't married then. I got married in 74. Uh, it seemed that the people who, in the reserves, they didn't want you to, I wanted to do stuff. I mean, I when I go to reserve duty, I wanted to be busy. And the people that were already there they would come to reserve duty and they just wanted to kind of see who's getting promoted, who's retiring and this kind of thing, and I'm ready to go. Then when you go to the hospital, uh, you see somebody having a problem and you immediately take care of it and then they want to reprimand you for ordering an IV or starting an IV or ordering an x-ray or drawing blood and sending it to the lab because you know that this person's got something other than just a plain old fever. So it was the frustration of dealing with the stateside nurses who didn't want you to do anything. But I didn't know what they were saying. They didn't, we were talking past each other. I think that's what was going on. Uh, I'm thinking here's a person with a fever of 105 you need to get blood work to figure out what's going on with them. And they're figuring, well, we can't do anything until Tuesday when the doctor comes in. But I was the bad guy because I draw the blood and send it to the lab. And then I said, and when he came back, the one that I did, he had, what was it he had? Meningitis. Mm -hmm. I said, and that ain't too friendly with adults. So now at least we know what it is, but they were still trying to write me up for and you're busy trying to save his life. I say theirs too because there they're all exposed to meningitis and they were going to wait until Tuesday and here it is Saturday. You're going to wait till Tuesday when the doctor comes in to order it. So then that's when they thought with my, I was a little tense with them. But I think what I figured out, I didn't think it was PTSD or anything like that because I reasoned that those nurses just wasn't ready and they were more upset with me. But then when I realized after we started talking that there was some stuff up in there that needed to come out. I hate when these <sighs> moments happen, but Connie, we're running into the tyranny of the clock and there's quite a bit more that I still wanted to talk to you about. Your involvement with this march you just talked about, the women's um, memorial in Washington, D.C. for the Vietnam Memorial out there, your trip back to Vietnam in 2012. So between you and me, can we agree to get back somewhere down okay. the road someplace and talk about that a bit more? Yes. And just okay. a couple questions for you then as we finish off for today. Were you proud of your time and your service in Vietnam and as an Army nurse? 
I started being proud of my service about 1984. But before that, I was more embarrassed by it because I was accused of prolonging the war. I was called baby killer. I was called all the things that wasn't so. I had a, my daughter's, uh, one of my daughter's preschool classmates' father said that I had to be a liar when I went to the school to tell them about my Vietnam experience because there were no women in Vietnam. And so we had to settle that up. But I did get to meet that father and convince him that uh, women were there. He was there at the same time I was. But how could you think that there were no women in Vietnam? But I told him, you were one of the fortunate ones. You never came to the hospital where I was working. And that's why you think not. But after that was OK. But to my daughter was, she was beside herself when they said mama was a liar. But um, I was able to take care of that within a couple of days because I asked to meet that father and, and here bring him these, up to date. <laughs> these soldiers that you did help out who arrived in these hospitals, yeah. who didn't look at you just as a woman, but probably as some kind of an angel. Yeah, they did. I felt like I was 22 and some of them may have been older or whatever, but they looked at me like I was their mother and some of them actually clung to me as if I was their mother. And so I found myself having to force myself to be older and more mature than I really was. And I just say that was only by the grace of God, because I tell you, I had no experience to be as mature as they forced me to be. How else did that experience change you? It made me appreciate the fact that people can be in the same place at the same time and see something totally different. And uh, that was important because even I did not know where I had been um, the whole time I was there because she was so closed in. And even when I was exposed to uh, what we now know as Agent Orange, I didn't know that's what it was because they didn't tell us at the time that that's what it was. It was just my military police brother had told me that that was just the napalm that they burned up. And that's why we had no grass and no foliage in this area. And that's why the trees were the way they were and the monkeys were running around looking like they hadn't had anything to eat because they hadn't. Um, but it was in probably in about nine years later when I realized that's what I had been exposed to. Connie, this has been a very important interview to add to our collection. We've got quite a few already on the Vietnam mm -hmm. War, but I really appreciate your willingness to, uh, to field the questions I've been throwing yeah. at you and <laughs> be very candid and make us understand what it was really like for you. And you've done such mm -hmm. a marvelous job. And I thank you for that. Do you okay. have any final comments for me as we finish up today? No, I just say that the parade that we had, was the Vietnam veterans said that they won't welcome us home, we'll do it ourselves. And so that's what we ended up doing. And I think that was the beginning of healing of America for over the war. And I think that's definitely worthy of us sitting down some other time and, and uh, mm -hmm. getting some more flesh on that story. But mm -hmm. again, thank you very much, Connie.